Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Victor Jimenez. I'm the executive director of the Outshine LGBTQ Plus Film Festival. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you enjoyed the screening of A Stormy Night, as well as with the short film See You Soon. Uh, tonight, we're going to have a double header for the Q and A. First, we're going to have the live, um, the live Q and A with the director of A Stormy Night, and then we're going to play to you a pre-recorded Q and A with the director of See You Soon. So with that being said, let me welcome to the uh, studio, director of A Stormy Night, David Morogas. Hello. Hello, David. How are you doing tonight? I'm good, thank you. Very excited. Excellent, excellent. Why don't you let the audience know where you're calling us from? I'm actually calling from Malaga right now, which is in the south of Spain. It is 5 a.m. here. Excellent, excellent. And you know, one thing I forgot to actually say, you're, not, you're the writer, director, and obviously, you know, co-star, you know, one of the main leads of the film. Yeah. Um, first thing I want to say is, you know, quite frankly, I, I love your film, and it was a beautifully shot film. You know, I, I just want to just say that right now. Um, and you being the writer and the director, what was your, you know, what was the inspiration for the film? Can you tell us um, where the idea came from? And then how long did it take you to get from the idea to actually, you know, having the film finished? Yeah, well, thank you so much for saying that. I think the idea for the movie really came from the fact that um, I wanted to set up to do something really simple because it was my first time directing a feature film and I had done short films in the past, um, but this was the first time doing something a little longer. And just like with many things that I've written in the past, it all began with a piece of dialogue that I started writing. And I was very in love and fascinated by the idea that there's many contradictions that happen in the mind of one person at one point. And with a very specific subject matter, you can have a lot of opinions about it. And I thought it was interesting to have very different opinions on different subject matters projected in two different characters because that's something that you can do in a, um, in a movie and then have these two points of view just dialogue and have a conversation throughout a night and the process to make it was actually it was long because the the writing and the shooting and the the first editing was sort of like a one motion kind of thing which lasted for about i would say six months but then the process to actually finish the movie, which means to have um, color correction and sound and uh, a final cut, um, that lasted a little more uh, about, I would say, another additional six months. And then of course we had to release the movie, which was um, a whole different experience with the whole pandemic and everything that happened. Uh, but overall, I'm happy. I think it was, overall it was, it might've been like a year and a half um, from idea to execution, so I'm 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 happy. No, oh, excellent. That's actually a pretty pretty good turnaround time. Now, I'm sure it's a question a lot of people in the audience have: is that you made a creative choice to shoot the film in black and white, and also I think a further creative choice to go with a very high contrast image of that, which I'm not sure if also <laughs> the audience maybe caught on to it, but with the costume design too like your character was always in black and Alan's character was always in light colors, white or the striped shirt. So there was obviously a theme there of, you know, why the black and white? Why, why, why did you make that choice? That's so great that you picked up on that um, because it was a very conscious choice. We, what we started with a very minimal approach to what we wanted to tell. And when I sat down with Alfonso Herrera Salcedo, the cinematographer, and we started thinking about the look of the movie, we thought, well, this is clearly a very simple approach to a story. And so we have two characters in one location and it made a lot of sense that we would play with only these two um, elements, which are darkness and light. And with that, we thought, well, it has to be in, in black and white then, so that we had a lot of room and a lot of space to put attention to these details. Who is wearing what? Where is the light coming from? And what is the light? Um, shining on and you know it, believe it or not we put a lot of effort into thinking okay where is the light going to come from which character is sort of like bringing the light into the scene and what is it bouncing on etc etc again this was also my first movie so we wanted to play 
very easy. We wanted to do things very simple. And we thought the black and white would allow um, more control over these decisions. No, it, 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 you actually, um, you know, you said there was a certain, uh, like I said, I love the black and white. And then, and, and one of the things that caught my attention is that since you, it is an intimate story, um, you did a, a really excellent job with what I think, like cr blocking scenes and, and almost creating like, almost like a, a great still image with, with certain setups, but like, my favorite scene in in well, one of my favorites, but like at least I'll call it my favorite scene in the movie was the um, like oh I would love butter scene when when your character is sitting on the sofa and then Tristan is in the kitchen and then Alan comes in but even though you're lower you're looking up at him and he's and he like he's, you're still dominating it you're kind of creating this triangle then all of a sudden you sit down and you have this void space you're wearing black he's wearing white but then Tristan comes in sits in the middle of you. And I'm not sure we did it on purpose, but he's wearing a like a black jacket, but then he's wearing a white shirt. And then because of the heights, you're still kind of maintaining the same blocking you had originally. And also just the awkwardness, the 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 the, the way you looked at it, like and, and you had that throughout the whole film. So like, I mean, I'm guessing you obviously conscientiously did this blocking. I mean, like it, it was it was actually amazing. <laughs> so that's that, amazing. But go on and talk more about that, please. That's so cool that you picked up on that. Um, that's that's so great. Yes, I mean, to me, there's um, while I was studying as an undergrad, I studied in Spain, and I studied. We call it media communication, but there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot that can go into um, studying media communication. And one of my favorite courses that we did was on. We would call it color and composition, and so we learned a lot about composition, and we learned a lot about all the all the things that you can do with your frame, and you know we learned a lot about what it means to have a certain figure in one space and another thing in another one, and 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 how the mind sort of like tricks the audience or tricks someone who's watching a painting to feel like the painting should be moving this way or moving that way, and so. Through composition, you can accomplish so much because if you have, for instance, a situation where there's a balance and you break that balance with an element, the audience is going to think, oh, this element doesn't belong here. Um, but then again, you can also um, add to that motion when you play with camera movements. You know? And if you um, move the camera a certain way and then you stop, then you have the audience thinking, I want to see more or I want to go further or, um, or you leave with the audience thinking uh, we've been like moving this way i feel like at some point we'll be moving the other way so all of these are elements that you can play with and when you're doing a movie with such low budget like we did that's all you have really um you don't have special effects you don't have um you know george clooney you don't have like <laughs> all these elements so really you you're left with all of these minimal tools and then um that's all you can really use to convey uh, the story. But that's so cool that you picked up on that because I feel like there's so much um, that goes into telling a story that when you watch the movie for the first time, you don't really notice and then um, all these details add up to the story. Well, that's that's probably something of me where when it's not quick edits, I like to see how, like especially good filmmakers, and that's to me like you you did a really, you, you, you have a lot of talent because it was a lot of effort goes into actually blocking a scene. and. People have to appreciate that. That you know, there, you, there, there, there are reasons why you place things, and and really good filmmakers can actually convey a lot by doing that. One interesting thing with that scene that I know, that, you know, there wasn't really much music used in the film, but that scene actually had like the one instance that I definitely remember where music was actually called out. Uh, was there? What was the choice behind using the music for that scene? Yeah, well, the music was made by a very good friend of mine. And um, we tried very different things when we started thinking about music before even reaching out to Angel Perez. That's, that's his, the name of the composer. And I remember very well when we, when we said, okay, we, we clearly need like a whole, the music's gonna be a whole thing here. Like the camera is one thing, characters are doing their thing. Like music is gonna do another very different thing. And I remember that I didn't really give any direction to, to my friend to, to Angel, I just gave him the movie and I said, you know, play with it, uh, have fun. And also, this is safe territory for all of us. A lot of the people that worked on this movie, this was our first movie. And so there was really no um, 
expectation of a certain kind of way of doing things. I just, I just remember I said, you know, play with it because it's uh, this is your playing field and I want you to experiment, to try things. And then he came up with this sort of like soundscape, like a digital soundscape that sometimes he adds acoustic instruments, but mostly it's just um, digital. And and I remember watching the movie for the first time with the music and I thought, when I understand my movie now in a way that I did not before. Um, and he's, he's just so good with like silences and tempos and the way where he places certain musical themes. Um, and then in that particular scene, I remember we play a lot of, with um, silence. So you have a, you know, a musical score doing something like tan, 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 and then it, a silence when one of the characters says something. And that just puts you in such a tension and such an ease, which was very um, important because of course, when you're, when you're dealing with, again, such um, minimal elements, you want the audience to still be like paying attention. And I think the music really accomplishes that because it's um, it, it comes when it has to come and it adds suspense and it adds this, this playfulness, playfulness that, um, that really helps the movie. Oh, excellent. The, um, now you might've answered this, but I just, I guess wanna see if it was purposeful. Except for, I think three scenes, pretty much every time you are always on the left and Alan is always on the right, except for, I think there was like the scene in the kitchen, the end when you call Clara. And I think in the, in the storm scene by the, by the stairs, but at, at one point, I think it's because you were coming down the stairs, but then, then the characters switch sides. Is, was there any symbolism or was it just because of lighting or was there a specific, you know, goal or reason there? Yeah, no, definitely. I think, um, in, in, Occidental culture, we read from left to right. So everything that moves to the right feels like it's advancing and everything that moves to the left feels like it's um, retracting. But it's funny because this only happens in in um, uh, in Occident. In Orient, of course, in some countries they read backwards. But so the idea is that as long as your motion goes from left to right, it feels like you're advancing. And I feel like one of the traits that Alan has is that for him to make sense of life, life has to be moving and you have to be advancing, you have to be moving all the time because if not, you stop and you, and you start wondering and that's sort of what happens when the storm comes that you have to like <laughs> stop and, and just sit with yourself and that's when you know he has a panic attack. And so he's always moving and I thought that a way to convey that was that we start, the very time we have a character introduction, the, uh, we have his character introduction, the camera does this very dramatic pan to the right and after that, it's always on the right. It's always going right, 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 right. Except that at the very end of the movie, the movie ends with an actual like a shot that goes to the other side of the screen. And this is a way of me saying, you know, this is a character that has learned that sometimes it's not always about like moving forward, 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 but also like just sitting a moment and having a toast with your boyfriend and um, <laughs> eating a toast with butter um, with your boyfriend. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed that the, now I'm kind of curious. The, the one thing I never could, I guess, figure out was why was it so important for your character to have your own a, a power adapter? Like, 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 why do you have to go this? Like, why couldn't you just use the other charger that was already made for the US outlet? <laughs> like, like, why was that so important? You know, sometimes, as a screenwriter, you add these MacGuffins that we call it, or like a tool to move the story forward. And I remember when I wrote that, I always pictured that Alan would have an Android phone and so there would be no charger in the house. And of course in Spain, we use different plugs. So, and that this is based on actual facts, like this is something that has happened to me that I will travel to the US and forget my, my um, plugs and then I can't plug my charger whatsoever. And I thought, I remember thinking, there's a lot of moments in the movie where they could have come up with an easier solution for him to charge his phone and see if the guy in Spain has answered the message or not. But I feel like it worked as a MacGuffin. Um, and so, you know, I just left it like that. <laughs> oh, no, no problems. I was like, it's a downpour. It can wait. No. <laughs> but no, the, um, so. <laughs> Out of curiosity, like um, what's next for the film? And then what's ne what's your next project after this film? Yeah. So what happened was that I was living in New York when we shot this movie. And by the end of it, we shot the movie with little to no budget. But then when we finished 
shooting and I had done a pre-editing of the movie so it looked like a first ensemble. Uh, there was this production company in Spain called Oberon Media and I showed them the cut and they said, oh, wait, there's something here and we want to, yeah, we want to help out, finish the movie and stuff. And so they financed the, the finishing of the movie, which really is like the main uh you that's when you need the money actually because like to make the movie whatever you shoot it on your iphone we didn't use an iphone of course we we shot with with the cameras that we had available and then but then you really know like what it costs to make a movie when you need someone to do color correction and sound and stuff like that and so they were the ones that helped me finish the movie um when we finished the movie well and then that happened in spain so i had to move from new york to barcelona and then i stayed in barcelona mm -hmm. so after that we found this um, sales agent which are uh, they're called the open reel and they're the ones mm -hmm. that connected us to different film festivals so we're going to try and have a traditional festival run wherever that may mean uh, nowadays because of course you know festivals are, are have changed now and it's a different ecosystem but we're going to try and aim for a festival run and then we have a theatrical release date in spain uh and we still i, I don't think we still have a theatrical release date uh in the us um but i think there are plans to release theatrically whenever movie uh, theaters open again um so i'm excited about that and then what happened was that um we we started uh, doing live uh, not live, online film festivals here in Spain. And the movie was very successful here. So that allowed me to already sign a contract to make another movie. And that's going to happen, who knows, uh, 2021, 2022. Uh, but I'm writing, I'm writing already what's going to be my next movie, which is going to be uh, shot in Catalan, actually, in Barcelona. Oh, very nice. Well, I hope all this stuff, you know, <laughs> with the COVID-19 gets kind of taken care of. So at least at some point in, in 2021, you can actually start filming, but at least you're being creative during this time, um, and you, you know you you have the project that you're working on. Um, David, like I, as, as you can tell, I obviously loved you know your film. I love the, the technique behind it. It was just it was it was really refreshing to see nothing with the quick edits and how you were you you just carefully composed everything, like like in like in like a, a great photographer and artist and and all that. And I, I do want to say that. And I, hopefully my audience will like watch it again <laughs> uh, when they Thank can you. To, to, to take a look at it. Um, and then um, I, I will say to the audience, we do have that recorded Q&A coming up. What we're going to do now is we're going to say goodbye to David. We're going to run the trailer for Stormy Night. And then when we come back, we will show the recorded Q&A. So, uh, David. Thank you very much for taking your time. It's very late. Oh, no, it's actually very early over there in, in, in Spain. What it's time very is it? It's very uh, early, yeah. It's five five thirty now. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you for waking up early uh, and for joining us. And um, my you. pleasure. Yeah. No. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for for watching. Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to share my work. So thank you so much. Excellent. Due to unexpected weather conditions, all flights domestic and international have been canceled. Yeah. Sure. He can stay in your room. I mean, I'm practically chained to my desk doing work anyway, so I'll be here. Yeah, no worries. Marcos? Hi. That's, oh, that's a Spanish thing. Two, Two kisses. kisses, right. <laughs> Claire says you guys know each other from college? College, yeah, yeah. She said you make movies? Yeah, it's a dog. What's it about? It's about gay sex and oh. dicks. Okay. Yeah. She seemed really excited about this. Two gay guys in one house. Hi, honey. Hi. You blew him. No. You kissed him. No. Are you a virgin? Well, I don't believe in monogamy, so cheating makes no sense. I feel like I've yet to meet someone that can look me in the eyes and say monogamy makes sense. You've never been in a relationship? Right. No spoilers. You wouldn't get it. Why wouldn't I get it? Well, you clearly don't. Living in the present and how you decide you want to live in the present. Alrighty, everybody. Now we're gonna do the recording for See You Soon of the, uh, the Q&A for that. So stand by while I share my screen.
Oh, apologies. Hold on one second. Let me fix this real quick. Let's try again now. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Victor Jimenez, your executive director of the Outshine LGBTQ Plus Film Festival. With us, we have director Tyler Rabinowitz uh, from See You Soon. Tyler, welcome to the our recorded virtual Q and A here. Thank you for having me. Wish oh, you're okay. live, but this is awesome. <laughs> Well, you know, interestingly enough, one of the, I guess, the, the, the few benefits of the COVID-19 is uh, this festival, since everything is kind of virtual, we're, we actually have more filmmakers and talent present than uh, we've ever had before. So that's a, a small little benefit to the whole thing. Yes. So, yeah. so uh, first I want to say I loved your film. Um, you know, it's a great short film. I uh, thought it was very tender and beautifully shot. Um, can you, uh, I know you, you wrote it, you directed it, like what was the impetus to make the story and um, and how did it come about? Totally, I, uh, this is based on a personal experience I had uh, and really for me, when I came away from that experience, I just was really struck by um, the way that I felt that um, each of us found ourselves in this sort of whirlwind romance we were not expecting whatsoever and with that, came all of these unexpected emotions. It truly was this emotional avalanche for us by the end of the weekend. Um, and I think that there was, I, I just was really fascinated by this extra weight that there seemed to be on the situation because being queer people um, who grew up in places where we each grew up thinking that like a whirlwind romance, a fairy tale kind of romance wasn't something we'd ever get to experience ourselves. And once we finally found something like that through these, really the circumstances we I think we both were just desperate to make sure that that uh, connection never faded and uh, even though the weekend had this expiration date and I just thought there was so much tension there that was so specifically queer even though long distance relationships internet relationships uh, happen all the time with everybody but I just felt like there's a certain queerness to it that I wanted to explore in a film. Interesting, interesting. Um, I, I gotta ask the. Uh, <laughs> did you ever reconnect with the the person <laughs> afterwards? <laughs> I actually live with him now. <laughs> oh, they see. There's a so happy there, ending. That's actually. Oh, well, there's a happy ending. Um, so that's good. It's, it's actually like a, a great fairy tale. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. A, that's a, that's definitely a nice bonus. The um, I gotta say something, and it, not only just this film also, but for you, you had a previous film in our festival a few years back, <clears throat> How I Got to the Moon by Subway. You shoot beautifully. Like, you, you're, the look of your, your short films look more expensive than probably what they are, but they, they just look incredible. Like, how, how do you go about doing that, or, or is that all post? Thank you so much. Um, I, I think that I really just... I really look to the the crew, the the DP, the gaffer uh, uh, on both of those films, uh, Orrin Sofer on See You Soon, Jackson uh, Agin on How I Got to the Moon, um, and just the crew they bring. And uh, it, it, it's just like, I don't really, I, I can't even take credit for it. I, I think that um, there's just a lot of really good people in this craft in that are young and up and coming in, uh, all across the country, all across the world really now. Um, and they just uh, knocked it out of the park. I don't really know what else to say other than that. I know that um, something that for if like a short filmmaker was trying to kind of elevate their craft, something that I would suggest is to start forming close relationships to places like uh, Panavision. Uh, Panavision was very generous with the package that they lent our, us for See You Soon. And uh, so that was, truly so helpful um and similarly 
the Jacob Burns Film Center in New York helped with how I got to move my subway. So uh, building relationships with those places that can kind of cut some discounts will give you more access to equipment, but it is so much about the people behind the camera as well. No, the, that's one of the things I, I, I definitely noticed. I'm going to ask you another just curious technical question from my point of view. Yeah. You have seen that they're walking uh, down the sidewalk, and uh, and, you, and I think they're you get the water on one side and people on, on park benches on the other. Were those all extras, or did you actually have to get everyone to sign a release to be in the short film? Um, those are we had to shoot that guerrilla style. Okay. Uh, we just. Uh, had a little camera and we just plopped it down and they did like one or two takes and we ran away. <laughs> um, and we just kind of like, hey, everybody, like, is this okay? And everyone, out. okay, no, I was just kind of curious about it. The, um, the other thing, you know, I mentioned it when I, when I did the, the intro for the short film. And again, it's like something I see in, in your work in general. You, you make very tender films and like, like tender stories and, and, and you kind of, you know, this was like a, basically a true life story to you, but that's something that caught my attention. There, you know, there was like a, a genuineness and just like a tender uh, whole feeling. Um, is that something that you like bring into your storytelling? Was it, is it something you always try to, or just, just the, by the nature of the story, that's how it came about? Yeah, I, I think that queer tenderness and, and intimacy is really important to me because I just want with my body of work, I just want to put more points of references out there uh, that show that side of us um, and capture sort of the breadth of who we are and sort of the sensitivity that comes with who we are and what we've been through. And um, yeah, I, I think that so much can be felt in, it's like a whole lifetime can be felt between like two characters, even just in their glances and even just in uh, very few words, you know, or just in a conversation that doesn't necessarily mean too much plot wise, other than the conversation is being had, like when the two characters are like sitting on the hammock, you know, it, it's just letting things breathe and letting these vignettes play out that feel like memories, but also feel so have like this extra significance. I, I'm just fascinated by that. I love those softer moments. Yeah, I, I love you said like letting the moment kind of breathe um i think that's actually kind of uh, catches it for me in terms of like what i why i felt that way like you know it was just like a like a tender moment and it just was allowed to sit there and perfectly natural yeah. I, I i i like that the um the other thing that i obviously worked was the, the casting you did with with the two leads had you worked with those actors before was it easy finding them have you worked with them since or what's what's what was the story there i had never worked with them before but I, I worked with casting director Freya Krasnow on two previous shorts that I produce, both for Matthew Puccini, his uh, short film The Mess He Made, and his short film Lavender. And I loved working with her and, and sort of her strategy behind trying to cast uh, out queer talent and also talent that was like on the rise where, you know, it could be mutually beneficial for both the film and for the actors to, to have this, um, like with Lavender, we had two actors who were about to be on Broadway together in Torch Song, um, Michael Yuri and Michael Sue Rosen. And so with this kind of in a similar approach, um, she had suggested Johnny Beauchamp and James Crusadi Moyer. James was about to be on Broadway in Slave Play. We shot this last summer before uh, they made the transfer to Broadway. And then Johnny Beauchamp was about to be a, 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 a star, one of the leading roles on the CW's Katie Keene, the Riverdale spinoff where he was gonna play Jorge slash Ginger Lopez, which is a, a drag queen on network television uh, in a leading role. Pretty amazing. And so um, we, that was appealing, but they were also were just so supremely talented. I, she set up a, a FaceTime with Johnny and I, and after an hour of talking, there wasn't even like a real audition. I just knew I wanted to work with him so badly. You could just feel that he had something special. And then um, the kind of clincher was that I found out they both went to undergrad together at Marymount acting school. So they had a history and I felt that was super important if we were going to try and build intense chemistry over the course of a three day shoot. Um, so that's how that came to be. The, uh, out of curiosity, the, uh, was it a good history that they had or were they always competing for the same roles? And <laughs> you know, I didn't know. All I needed to know is that they were scene partners and, uh, in college a few times that I believe and Johnny, uh, 
I cast Johnny first, and then when I was looking for the lead, um, he had suggested James, and it just so happened James was on our short list. And then um, uh, James had self-taped, and he did such an extraordinary job there. I knew in like 10 seconds of watching that tape that I wanted to work with him. Perfect. Well, I mean, definitely hit it out of the park with the casting, and you know, they were they were both incredible. The um, I was going to say, what what's actually what are you working on now? What's what's next for you? Um, now I'm developing my first feature. It's certainly an interesting time to be doing that, but uh, I've been really enjoying just you know trying to accept the situation we're all in and take this time to really develop it and make it everything I can and take this time to rewrite as much as I need. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to shooting that sometime, hopefully next year. Um, but okay. it'll be another queer film. That was going to be my uh, quick follow-up. Is it as another, another yeah. queer film? And then, uh, well, we'll definitely be looking forward to it uh, when it's done and, uh, and see how it goes. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, for, for basically being here for the, uh, or meeting with me for the Q and A. Definitely much appreciated. I know our audience definitely enjoyed your film. And uh, thank you, Tyler. And, uh, and though the audience doesn't know it, good luck with the move to Palm Springs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I'm very much looking forward to it. All right. Excellent. And uh, have a nice day. Yeah, you too. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the Q&A. Good night, and, uh, and you enjoy the show.